Astronomy, the Science of the Heavenly Bodies by David Todd. Ptolemy and his great book. Ptolemy was an observer of the heavens, though not of the highest order, but he had all the work of his predecessors, best of all, Hipparchus, to build upon. Ptolemy's greatest work was the Megale Syntaxis, generally known as the Almagest. It forms a nearly complete compendium of the ancient astronomy, and although it embodies much error because built on a wrong theory, the Almagest nevertheless is competent to follow the motions of all the bodies in the sky with a close approach to accuracy, even at the present day. This marvelous work written at this critical epoch became as authoritative as the philosophy of Aristotle, and for many centuries it was the last word in the science. The old astrology held full sway, and the Ptolemaic theory of the universe supplied everything necessary. Further progress, indeed, was deemed impossible. The Almagest comprises in all 13 books, the first two of which deal with the simpler observations of the celestial sphere, its own motion, and the apparent motions of the sun, moon, and planets upon it. He discusses, too, the postulates of his system and exhibits great skill as an original geometer and mathematician. In the third book, he takes up the length of the year, and in the fourth book, similarly, the moon and the length of the month. Here, his mathematical powers are at their best, and he made a discovery of an inequality in the moon's motion known as the evection. Book 5 describes the construction and use of the astrolabe, a combination of graduated circles with which Ptolemy made most of his observations. In the sixth book, he follows mainly Hipparchus in dealing with eclipses of sun and moon. In the seventh and eighth books, he discusses the motion of the equinox and embodies a catalog of 1,028 stars, substantially as in Hipparchus. The five remaining books of the Almagest deal with the planetary motions and are the most important of all of Ptolemy's original contributions to astronomy. Ptolemy's fundamental doctrines were that the heavens are spherical in form, all the heavenly motions being in circles. In his view, the Earth, too, is spherical and is located at the center of the universe, being only a point, as it were, in comparison. All was founded on mere appearance combined with the philosophical notion that the circle being the only perfect curve, all motions of heavenly bodies must take place in Earth-centered circles. For 14 or 15 centuries, this false theory persisted on the authority of Ptolemy and the Almagest, rendering progress toward the development of the true theory impossible. Ptolemy correctly argued that the Earth itself is a sphere that is curved from east to west and from north to south as well, clinching his argument, as we do today, by the visibility of objects at sea the lower portions of which are at first concealed from our view by the curved surface of the water which intervenes. To Ptolemy also, the Earth is at the center of the celestial sphere, and it has no motion of translation from that point. But his argument fails to prove this. Truth and error indeed are so deftly intermingled that one is led to wonder why the keen intelligence of this great philosopher permitted him to reject the simple doctrine of the Earth's rotation on its axis. But if we reflect that there was then no science of natural philosophy or physics proper, and that the age was wholly undeveloped along the lines of practical mechanics, we shall see why the astronomers of Ptolemy's time and subsequent centuries were content to accept the doctrines of the heavens as formulated by him. When it came to explaining the movements of the wandering stars, or planets as we term them, the Ptolemaic theory was very happy insofar as accuracy was concerned, but very unhappy when it had to account for the actual mechanics of the cosmos in space. Sun and Moon were the only bodies that went steadily onward, easterly, whereas all others, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, 
although they moved easterly most of the time, nevertheless would at intervals slow down to stationary points, where for a time they did not move at all, and then actually go backward to the west or retrograde, then become stationary again, finally resuming their regular onward motion to the east. To help out of this difficulty, the worst possible mechanical scheme was invented, that known as the epicycle. Each of the five planets was supposed to have a fictitious double, which traveled eastward with uniformity, attached to the end of a huge but mechanically impossible bar. The Earth-centered circle in which this traveled round was called the deferent. What this bar was made of what stresses it would be subjected to, or what its size would have to be in order to keep from breaking, none of these questions seem to have agitated the ancient and medieval astronomers, any more than the flat earth astronomy of the Hindu is troubled by the necessity of something to hold up the tortoise that holds up the elephant that holds up the earth. But at the end of this bar is jointed or swiveled another shorter bar, to the revolving end of which is attached the actual planet itself. And the second bar, swinging once round the end of the primary advancing bar, would account for the backward or retrograde motion of the planet as seen in the sky. For every new irregularity that was found in the motion of Mars, for instance, a new and additional bar was requisitioned until interplanetary space was hopelessly filled with revolving bars, each producing one of the epicycles, some large, some small, that were needed to take up the vagaries of the several planets. The Arabic astronomers who kept the science alive through the Middle Ages added epicycle to epicycle until there was every justification for Milton's verses descriptive of the sphere. With centric and eccentric scribbled ore, cycle and epicycle, orb in orb.